Good evening and welcome to the 11th and final presentation of the 2023-2024 season of Avalanche Canada's webinar series. I'm Sarah Taylor, your producer for this evening, and Amy Irving's our moderator. She's going to be looking out for your questions in the Q&A box tonight. We're excited to be here for our final webinar of this winter. Over the past three years, we've presented a variety of webinars and found that being online means that we get to share our Avalanche safety messaging with you even more than before. We're stoked that you're here with us this evening, and we always appreciate you sharing these webinars with others who might enjoy them. Our mission is to help educate backcountry users so you can go out and play safe. We want you all to know more, go further, and come home. First, we'd like to acknowledge that our session is being hosted on the territory of four nations, the Snakes, Shkwetmek, Tanaha, and Silks. As a national organization, we also acknowledge the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit nations on whose land we live and recreate. Before we get going here tonight, we're going to thank our sponsors. We're so grateful for our sponsors' loyal support and for their help in working, sorry, their work in helping us reach backcountry users over the winter. We have our government partners, our program partners, our affiliations, our premier sponsors, and our supporting sponsors, and our contributors. Thanks to all of them for helping us do what we do. Before we get going, a couple of housekeeping notes to share with you. Everyone will be automatically muted tonight. There'll be opportunities to ask questions, and to do so, you can either use the raise hand icon on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we can unmute you so you can ask your question live, or you can ask them in the Q&A box, which you can also find at the bottom of your screen. If you're gonna type questions, try and use the Q&A box rather than the chat box, because sometimes we don't see them in the chat box if the chat's going quite fast. Stick around till the end, because tonight we're gonna to be pulling some swag from the North Face for you to win. Tonight's presentation is Managing March. March is historically a tricky month for recreating avalanche terrain, but this season we're heading into the month with a slightly special set of circumstances. We currently have widespread weak layers in the snowpack and conditions are primed for human triggering. It's what people often refer to as spicy out there. We're gonna be taking a deeper look at what's happening in the snowpack, why it's so tricky to manage and how you can adapt to these difficult conditions. We're also gonna look at what comes next. Our presenter tonight is Tyson Retty. Tyson's an Avalanche Canada forecaster and an avid backcountry skier and adventurer. He joined our team in 2021 after working as a guide in the mechanized industry. As well as working at Avcan, Tyson has other multiple roles within the industry, including teaching AST courses for blind skiers as part of his work with the Braille Mountain Initiative. When he's not in the office, and you best believe we keep him pretty busy, uh, you can find him in his mountains around his home in Invermere. So let's dive in and get started. Without further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen and pass it on to Tyson. Enjoy the presentation. Awesome. Thanks for the intro, Sarah. Um, so there'll be one thing that'll be a little bit different about tonight's webinar versus some of the others. Uh, Sarah mentioned that I teach avalanche skills training courses um, for blind skiers as part of my work with Braille Mountain Initiative. And I got into that because I myself am vision impaired. So once I start the screen share, you'll actually be able to hear the screen reader that I use in order to use a computer and, and access digital information. So periodically you'll hear that screen reader announcing the title of slides, things like that. Anyway, I'll get going here with the presentation. I'm just gonna share my screen. Task switching, managing March street edit pptx powerpoint F5. Participants okay, can so now see your screen. Said, our uh, presentation tonight is titled Managing March. And what we're going to focus on is the special public avalanche warning that we are currently in, um, as well as kind of the managing March street that, edit uh, led to us putting that warning out. And what we're kind of thinking about as we look forward into the future once the warning is over. So this special public avalanche warning um, was issued for two main reasons. The first is we've got a pretty weak setup in the snowpack. Um, we've got a particularly concerning weak layer that in many areas is buried a meter to um, up to two meter in some of the deeper spots. Um, this weak layer was the result of warm weather at the end of January and into early February. Some areas saw um, quite a bit of rain associated with that warm weather as well. And so that resulted in a crust um, that extends to mountaintop or near mountaintop for the majority of our, actually all of our forecast areas. 
Um, and in some places, there's as much as 10 centimeters of loose facets above that layer. And the crust itself could be up to 30 centimeters thick, particularly on the coast. Um, then the next factor is the weather. So last week, we saw a series of significant storms um, impact the majority of our forecast regions. Um, you can see I've got a few numbers on the screen there. Um, the last pulse of that storm um, is the uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Um, at the Tantalus station, we saw 77 mils in 48 hours and nearly 60 mils at several stations throughout the interior. Um, however, we do know that there was actually quite a bit more snow than that, higher elevations from reports that we've got from other operators. And um, leading up to the issuing of the... From app and moderator to... Um, we uh, observed quite a bit of concerning avalanche activity. There was a number of human triggered avalanches, um, remotely and sympathetic uh, triggered avalanches. And during that most active period of those storms, there was widespread natural avalanche activity as well. Um, what we've got here, this is a video that was sent to us from Frozen Pirate. It's actually a few years old, but this is a really good example of a remotely triggered avalanche. So you'll see that the sledder in this video um, is not involved in the avalanche, it's running next to them. So remotely triggered avalanches, what these are is these are avalanches that we trigger when traveling on low angle terrain or just terrain that's not steep enough to avalanche. But our presence on that terrain causes a failure in the snowpack. That failure will then propagate through the snowpack into terrain above us, around us, below us, whatever, that is steep enough to avalanche under the current conditions. So this is um, concerning for a couple of reasons. Um, one, you could be doing, you know, you could be doing a good job or what you think is a good job managing your risk under the current conditions. You're choosing low angle terrain. So an example might be. Um, you know, you're wanting to cut across a feature, but instead of tra instead of cutting across the steepest portion of the feature, you know, you identify a nice supported looking bench that you're going to choose to travel across instead. But in doing that, you could trigger the steeper slope above you that then avalanches down onto you and your group. So despite thinking that you're using, you know, good group management, good uh, terrain management techniques, you could in fact still be involved in an avalanche if remote triggering is a concern. Um, the other component to this is when you're observing those remotely triggered avalanches, these are a really good indication that the snowpack is very unstable. So it's a good thing to keep an eye out for and especially to keep in mind right now um, with the layer that we're currently worried about. And here we've got a whole bunch more examples of remotely triggered avalanches. <clears throat> these were all sent to us by our field team in the Northwest. However, this, this uh, component of remotely triggered avalanches, this is not something that's unique to the Northwest. This is something that we've seen in all of our forecast areas. This is popping up um, in the Columbia's, Rockies, um, other parts of the coast range. So it's, um, yeah, it's a very widespread concern associated with this layer. Um, the other thing that we've seen quite a bit of with this uh, with this layer is what we call sympathetic avalanches or sympathetically triggered avalanches. So this is it's a similar concept to a remotely triggered avalanche, except instead of you know you or your snowmobile or something like that remotely triggering an avalanche, it's an avalanche that essentially remotely triggers another avalanche. So once an, an avalanche is um, initiates that failure then propagates further throughout the snowpack into adjacent features and can result in more avalanches. So this is a, this is a really good sign that the snowpack is incredibly weak if avalanches are triggering other avalanches. This video here was sent to us by Great Bear Heli Skiing up in the Northwest. However, like I said before, um, you know, with this stuff from the Northwest, even though that's where the photos and videos and, and whatnot are coming from, um, this stuff is very widespread. We're seeing this in all of our regions.
So what's going on in that video um, is there was a group of skiers that stopped on a supported bench feature. Um, the slope below them was triggered remotely. Then that avalanche sympathetically triggered numerous avalanches all the way along this feature. Um, the furthest away uh, sympathetically triggered avalanche was just over a kilometer away. So this footage was captured after the fact. They flew past it, got all that footage. Um, so yeah, super, super touchy conditions, um, remotely triggered avalanche that then sympathetically triggers a ton of avalanches up to a kilometer away. Once again, this is from the Northwest. However, this is stuff that we have seen um, everywhere. Okay, so, you know, right now we've got that spa in place. Um, it's set to expire uh, end of day tomorrow. However, we're currently in an extension. It was initially meant to expire at the end of the day on Monday. We extended it a few more days. And one of the big driving factors in extending that was that uh, we're still seeing that very concerning avalanche activity. There's still um, sympathetics and remotes, as well as today, as a result of the solar impact, uh, solar input, sorry, um, we saw more natural avalanche activity. So the concerning avalanche activity continues. Um, we've got that solar input for much of the interior. That's going to continue tomorrow. Then after that period of intense solar input, we may see a bit of a um, bit of a, a, a tapering off of natural avalanche activity again. However, these conditions are something that we're constantly assessing and reassessing and there is always the option to extend the warning if conditions warrant and if reports from professionals indicate that, you know, we're still seeing this very concerning behavior. <clears throat> However, if the spa does expire um, tomorrow evening as it's set to, that doesn't mean that this problem is just no longer there. Um, it's still very much going to be a concerning problem. It's something that we'll likely have in many of our forecasts. So we're pretty sure this layer will continue to be a problem, but there is definitely some uncertainty in how long it will be a problem and in exactly what regions it will continue to be a problem. Um, our best guess right now is that some of the shallower areas in the Columbia Mountains and the Rockies, perhaps the Selkirks and Purcells in particular when considering the Columbia Mountains, uh, will be areas where this will linger longer as a result of the snowpack in those areas typically being a bit shallower right now. Those layers are very much in, in prime depth for triggering, whereas um, certain parts in the Monashies, for example, this layer is now down already uh, deeper than a meter and a half, whereas in the Purcells, it's more like a meter. Parts of the Selkirks, more like a meter. So what we're getting into now is what we refer to as a high consequence, low probability scenario. Um, you've probably heard us use those terms before. Last year, that was a phrase that we used very frequently as a result of the deep persistent slab problem that um, plagued much of the interior for the majority of the season. So <clears throat> how do you manage this scenario? Um, as I said, this is something that we've talked about before. Um, this concept of uh, high consequence, low probability, this is not a, a new concept. And the real, um, in the real management strategy here is avoidance and patience. Um, it's giving the snowpack lots of time to heal. It's, it's, it's showing restraint and, you know, you see good conditions out there. You see a slope with no tracks in it. looks like it's, you know, it's going to be a good time. You know, it's, it's, it's patience, it's avoidance, it's leaving that slope alone. Um, and one of the big reasons is that, uh, the lack of signs of instability doesn't mean lack of instability. So the first sign of instability may in fact be um, the avalanche that unfortunately you're involved in. You know, there are certain scenarios where we'll talk about looking for signs of instability, shooting cracks, wumps, other avalanche activity, all that sort of thing. Um, and looking for those signs of instability is still very important. But in situations like this, not seeing those classic signs of instability doesn't mean that everything's good to go. Um, also, due to the depth of this layer, ski cutting is not a reasonable, ski cutting or sledding cutting is not a reasonable strategy to manage this. These layers are far too deep. The slab above, in most cases already, is far too stiff. There's the potential for avalanches to pull back into low angle terrain. We've already actually seen that quite a bit over the last couple of days. Um, and you know, you could get no results whatsoever with your ski cut, you make a few turns into the slope and then the whole thing rips 10 meters above you. So not an appropriate scenario to try and manage this um, with ski cutting. 
Now, some of our areas on the map do currently still have high avalanche danger. However, that's potentially going to change in the coming days, and those areas may drop down to considerable depending on, you know, what the weather does. Um, and so when you're seeing that uh, high danger on the map, the message is, is fairly straightforward. It's to avoid avalanche terrain altogether. But then once we get into that, um, the considerable ratings, more in line with the sort of um, high consequence, low probability concept, um, the message changes slightly. It becomes choosing very conservative terrain, very low consequence terrain. So that's even if you're riding, you know, steep slopes, you're looking for very small steep slopes where they're only capable of producing very small avalanches and also terrain that has a, a favorable run out if you are able to trigger one of those small avalanches. So um, no terrain traps below cliffs, creeks, roads, um, those sorts of things, or or walls of trees. That's, um, you know, a common terrain trap as well that not everybody thinks of, but, you know, you get a small pocket that's capable of producing a size one or one and a half. But if that one and a half ends in a wall of old growth timber, it can be uh, very consequential. Um, and then as always, managing your group. So reducing the overall risk of your group by only exposing one person at a time to the slope, uh, those sorts of things. <clears throat> Slide time. So... All that being said, you know, we've talked about a number of very scary things, remotely triggered avalanches, sympathetics, natural avalanche activity, all that sort of thing. Um, this doesn't mean to avoid going into the mountains by any means. Like I said, when it's high hazard, it means um, avoiding avalanche terrain. If it's more of the considerable sort of scenario, it means choosing very low consequence terrain, good group management. Um, but none of that means to avoid the mountains. By all means, you guys should definitely be getting out there. Uh, the sledding is likely awesome right now in most places. Uh, that photo that's on the screen right now is from one of our forecasters just a couple of days ago. And uh, yeah, three, four days ago, awesome sledding conditions. And the piece of terrain right there they're on really matches um, the conditions. We've got, uh, you know, a small slope capable of only producing small avalanches if it were to go. It's still relatively low angle. It might not even be possible that that can produce um, an avalanche. So perfect sledding terrain. Um, one of the common phrases that people use in the industry and have for a long time is if snowpack is the question, terrain is the answer. So when you're feeling uncertain, you're looking at a piece of terrain, you've got some uncertainty whether or not it's safe to ride just choose different terrain that's the answer it's looking for those smaller slopes those lower consequence slopes in some cases it's looking for terrain that is um you know not steep enough to produce avalanches uh, right now we've seen quite a few avalanches um that are the result of of avalanches propagating from steeper terrain into lower angle terrain and in some cases we've even seen avalanches being triggered in very low angle terrain you know, often people will talk about 30 degrees being a very um, important, important number, right? Looking for terrain mellower than 30 degrees. However, over the last week or so, I've been telling people that with some of the activity we've seen in very low angle terrain, um, the message is different. The message now is kind of um, avoid terrain. In some cases, it's, it's looking for terrain mellower than 25 degrees. So um, super low angle stuff. We've also seen quite a few avalanches being triggered in in forested terrain. So, you know, keep in mind the phrase, uh, if it's, um, if it, if it looks good to ride, it, it can slide kind of messing up that saying a little bit there, but I think you guys get the idea. If the trees are generously spaced enough that it makes for good sledding or good skiing, it's probably capable of producing avalanches. So that's another component of this to keep in mind if you're really trying to dial your terrain choices back. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Sarah and Amy and open it up to questions. I'm hoping you guys have plenty of them. All right, so it doesn't look as if we have any questions in the Q&A box as yet, but I am sure that they are coming in. We have lots of time for questions today. Um, I have a, I do have a quick question for you though, while we're waiting for everyone else to kick off. Um, you talked a little bit there about verifying conditions. Could you give us a little bit more detail on what, what you mean when you say that like what kind of thing are you looking for yeah perfect that's a really good question so with the size of our forecast regions and now with the flexible forecast region system those region boundaries do change every day and sometimes we have very small regions sometimes they're very large but even what we've got is a you know very small region by our standards um it's still uh 
massive really and there's going to be a ton of variability within that and so when we talk about verifying conditions it's part of the daily process that you learn when you take your uh, avalanche skills training course um and it's because of that variability that you can see within the region and that sort of thing you really need to be you know looking for those signs of instability looking at what the weather's doing looking at what's going on in the snowpack and seeing if what you're seeing um, out in the real world matches what you read about uh, in the forecast. So, you know, if your forecast was calling, if the forecast was calling for something like 10 centimeters overnight with moderate winds, and um, as a result, the expected avalanche problem is wind slab, and you get out there, and there's actually been about, you know, say 30 centimeters. Okay, well, you need to, those are the types of conditions you need to verify. So now what you're seeing in the field doesn't quite match what you saw in the forecast. So the problem may, in fact, not be a wind slab in this scenario. Perhaps it's a storm slab. You know, it may be more widespread, it may be touchier, things like that. So, you know, as part of your process of verifying conditions, you know, you realize it's different. And now hopefully you're going to dial things back a little bit. Um, so that's that's move transcription left parent closed captioning right part of this scenario here. Um, is that you know this layer being so widespread perhaps we'll get to a point where we think in a particular region the likelihood of this layer being triggered we may be reducing it to the unlikely to possible range or something like that well if you get out there and you're getting those signs of instability you know that should clue you in that okay it's it's perhaps not just in the possible range maybe it's in fact likely that makes a lot of sense um, we have another, we have some questions that starts to roll in. Uh, so the first one is, uh, are we generally finding that that early February crust facet combo is isolated to below 2,400 meters as suggested in the forecast, or are there notable weak layers above 2,400 meters? It doesn't specify which forecast in the question. Yeah. So that would be a key thing for sure. And this comes back to reading the forecast before you go into the mountains. There are some areas where that crust definitely extends to mountaintop. It doesn't taper off at 2,400 meters. So um, I'll use the example of the uh, sea to sky area, for example, that's somewhere where the crust certainly does extend to mountaintop. Um, looking at areas of the Purcells, there are areas there where the crust does start to thin From out to at 2,400 meters. Um, however, where there was an avalanche just a few days ago in the Purcells that initiated somewhere in the Alpine around maybe 2,600 meters. Um, and actually in that area, we're pretty sure that that crust, the one from end of January, early February, doesn't exist up there. However, that is an area where perhaps the crust from early December does extend to, could still be problematic, that may have been a component in that particular avalanche. So. So uh, yeah, I mean, to, to answer that question, uh, the 2,400 meter mark, relevant in some forecast areas, in others, not so much. It does go right to mountaintop. And then if you do get to that elevation where you're not finding that recent crust, there could be other problematic persistent weak layers above that. Um, so those earlier weak layers from early January and December in many areas have not been um, very problematic offer, connect with recently. Um, however, we still have, you know, wind slab is a problem in many of our regions, um, you know, with expect with some, you know, more active weather coming in in uh, in the near future here for the coast, you know, we'll probably see new storm slabs and that type of thing. So, yeah, the current weak layer is not the only problem in other areas. There's definitely avalanche concerns beyond the mark where that crust potentially tapers out. Excellent. Um, we have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, one of them is from Isaac, and it says, uh, what kind of things could help heal the snowpack in those shallower areas like the Rockies? Yeah, good question. I've been asked that one before, and it's a tough one um, to answer. I would say one thing that would almost definitely get rid of the current problem would be if we had a very massive rain event to mountaintop. So in the example of the current problem we have, that crust, prior to that very warm event that was in some cases also soaked with quite a bit of rain, there were weak layers from earlier in January and December and stuff that were concerns in those regions. And this, uh, the rain event that formed this layer, the warm weather event that formed this layer, did essentially cap the snowpack in some areas. And those uh, previous layers were no longer a concern. So 
essentially that could happen again. Um, you know, if you had a rain event that extended all the way to mountaintop, built this very significant capping crust similar to the one we have, that would help in the sort of in the immediate aftermath of that event, perhaps because you wouldn't have this current rain crust as a problem. You just have a new one. However, the same sort of um, course of events could then play out where you get this new crust, the weak layers below it are no longer a problem, but then as new snow stacks on that, you just essentially have a new persistent weak layer. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to that. Then the other one would be time. And time is the one that will definitely get rid of the problem, but that may be by July. Uh, the good thing about horrible snowpacks is they do disappear, but maybe it's by the time the winter's over. Um, on a on a shorter time frame, you know, some areas like um, uh, parts of the south coast, for example, we're already seeing some evidence. You know, perhaps say the Garibaldi area, something like that. Sky Pilot, we're already seeing some evidence. The layers break deep enough; it's becoming less reactive. So we're already seeing in some regions that maybe this layer is already becoming less problematic. So time in the short run could help over time. It gets weaker in the snowpack, assuming we have some weather, it gets buried deep enough that it requires, you know, a very large load to be triggered. So, you know, like a very dramatic warming event in the spring, a cornice fall, something like that. And then of course, on a broader scale, snowpacks don't last forever. Um, you know, come July, the problem will be gone. Um, and then, the rain event scenario is a possibility, but the con to that one is it is essentially forming a new weak layer that may cause the exact same problem, you know, weeks down the road from that event. I mean, not to mention no one likes skiing in the rain. So no, um, in the rain a bad time. <laughs> we have another message uh, from Ben, uh, and he wants to know if this problem will potentially heal in spring when the freeze thaw cycle begins. Um, yeah, sure. So it could, I mean, a similar, similar sort of thing to the, to the rain event. It's, it's possible that you get, you know, very dramatic warming in the near future or in the sort of um, immediate, um, sort of as that first dramatic warming is taking place, that's something that could result in this layer being reawakened in certain areas, that sort of thing. Um, typically in the spring, when we get that first very dramatic warm up. Uh, we'll see a pretty big avalanche cycle and you'll see a lot of the you know danger ratings on the map going to high that type of thing but if you go through multiple days of that spring diurnal pattern freeze thaw freeze thaw freeze thaw um it, at some point it, it's potential that it's there's the potential that that results in this layer no longer being a concern so um yeah that's a that's a great question and and one of the things that may you know in the immediate warming event probably this will be very concerning. Um, but afterward, a bunch of days of spring iron, maybe it's not a concern. Great. Uh, something to look forward to. Uh, we have another question uh, in the Q&A box, and it's, uh, if it's a February weak layer generally being seen on all aspects in the Rockies, or is it more limited than that? Good question. Uh, yes, because it's the result of warming um, or rain, it tends to not be aspect dependent. Um, however, um, you know, in some areas in the Columbia Mountains, for example, it does seem like there has been more human triggered activity on north through east aspects. Um, however, there has been activity on all aspects. So, so short answer, um, yeah, all aspects. Great. It looks as if maybe there aren't any more questions right now. Um, let's give it a second, see if any more come in. Obviously explained everything really well. Yeah. <laughs> no one has any follow-up questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, well, if any more come in, maybe we'll uh, we'll get you back. But, uh, oh, actually, one more has just come in. Perfect. <laughs> um, what kind of snow pit test would you recommend to test this layer? Mm, good question. Um, 
it would kind of depend on a number of things. Uh, the depth would be a good one. Um, so typically using a compression test beyond 120 centimeters um, would, would not be the right test. So you could do a deep tap test on this layer in those areas where we're finding it deeper, where it's shallower, um, perhaps a compression test is still reasonable. However, I would really caution against using those tests um, to rule a slope in as being something that's good to go. And that's a good sort of how you should generally be using um, snowpack tests like that is to rule slopes out. So once every other data point that you have says that a slope is good to go, using those tests is a good sort of you know, last ditch effort to find a reason not to ski it or not to sled it. Um, I don't like the idea of using tests to rule uh, terrain in. It's better to use those tests to rule terrain out. However, it's also, those tests are also valuable for um, just kind of doing your own sort of ongoing assessment, trying to establish whether or not the trend is a improving trend or a deteriorating trend. Um, so compression tests are good because they take less time and you can dig quite a few of them. And there can be a lot of value in doing many quicker tests over numerous aspects and elevation bands. Um, but they're a very small sample size and that's the downside to a compression test. Um, for something like this, um, an extended column test could be a really good test. Um, a number of professionals have made comments recently that in some cases, they weren't getting any extended column test results, which can give a bit of an impression that, oh, maybe, you know, the layer's not, in fact, you know, that concerning here or something like that. But then right next to it, if they do a, uh, a propagation saw test, they were getting some very spooky results. It does seem like with this particular layer, um, a propagation saw test has perhaps been one of the better tests to use. And one of the limitations of that test is that you have to have uh, an identifiable layer. Compression tests are good for helping you find layers sometimes, but the propagation saw test, you already have to know uh, what layer it is you're going to test. So like a very prominent service for layer can be a decent opportunity to use one, but I would say actually facets over thrust, which is what we're dealing with, is probably one of the best scenarios to use a propagation saw test because you'll have, um, you know, you'll have that loose layer of facets that's very easy to track with the back of your saw, but then also because you've got that very robust crust below, um, it'll limit the chance that you're going to kind of, um, you know, get a little bit off track with your saw as you're moving up through that column. So, yeah, it's kind of a long way to answer that question. Um, don't use those tests, especially under circumstances like this. Don't use those tests to rule terrain in. Only use it to rule terrain out when every data point is telling you that the slope's good to go. There can be a last ditch effort to find a reason not to ski it or sled it. Um, when, whether that's a compression test, propagation, saw test, ECT, I think that concept still applies. Um, but with this particular layer, um, a propagation saw test might be the best test. Great. Um, and actually, our Avalanche Canada South Rockies team uh, posted a really good video of them doing a propagation saw test today and getting some uh, pretty active results. So if you head to Instagram, it's Avcan South Rockies, I think is the account name off the top of my head. Uh, yeah, go take a look. It's really quite demonstrative of what we're seeing out there. Um, we do have another question that's come in. Uh, right. And it's about solar inputs. So the question is, in the short term, will the solar inputs be a source of weakness rather than being helpful? Um, yeah, I would say definitely. Right now, um, any solar input to the snowpack um, is causing it to deteriorate and likely increasing hazards. So, uh, for example, today, uh, for a good our forecast region that covers the majority of the um, southern of the central Columbia mountains, right, um, had a high hazard in the Alpine, and that was largely due to um, our expectation that solar input would further weaken this already scary snowpack and results in a increase in natural avalanche activity and an increase in sensitivity to human triggering. Um, and just going through some observations at the end of the day here, um, it does seem like there is some evidence that that was in fact the case. We saw a bit of an uptick in natural avalanche activity on south aspects today. 
So yeah, and in in general, um, you know, solar input uh, does cause avalanche danger to rise and and for the snowpack to deteriorate. Um, in the spring, you can kind of play the aspect game and and get some corn skiing and that type of thing. And so that's when you're, you know, after you've gone through a number of very significant freeze thaw cycles, you know, in the spring, typically it's a combination of daytime warming and solar input. And so you may be able to start your morning on east aspects and it's a real timing thing. You're looking for that solar input to soften the surface of the snow enough to make it good, soft uh, corn skiing. But I would still say, you know, the solar input for that brief period, I guess, is maybe improving ski quality. But, you know, if you were to wait too late to get on that east aspect in the morning, that solar input will eventually deteriorate the surface to the point where, you know, you're beyond corn skiing and you're starting to get into, you know, large, wet, loose territory, that type of thing. So I think that solar input is is always deteriorating the snowpack, but there's a timing element element in that, um, you know, that spring diurnal concept where, you know, it's it's only deteriorated the surface, which has made for, you know, good corn skiing. So yeah, right now, solar input definitely making things worse in general, uh, makes things worse. We're definitely not in that spring diurnal pattern yet. It's it's still winter. Yeah, and I think it's like worth noting, noting there as well that the uh, sort of March tends to be that time when the solar starts to become something we think a little bit more about. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we do have one more question. It's potentially yeah, a little, it's it's a little off topic. Um, would you rather be itchy or sticky for the rest of your life? <laughs> tough, tough call. Um, I think sticky. <laughs> yeah. From Kevin yeah. Baggett to all panelists, Colin, thanks. I could see that. Sure. I'll, uh, I'll agree with you. I'll go with sticky on that one. Okay. I do have one more actual avalanche related question. Okay, um, great. <laughs> what kind of depth uh, does the pressure of a skier impact the snowpack? Uh, and if the weak layer is below that depth, does that mean that we're unlikely to trigger it unless we hit a shallow point? Yeah. Good question. Um, 80 centimeters is kind of a good number to think of. If a layer is down 80 centimeters, it, there's a number of factors here because it, it depends on, on snow density and, and these other things as well. But I think 80 centimeters is a reasonable number to keep in mind. If you have a weak layer down 80 centimeters, um, in many circumstances, that's going to be uh, shallow enough that it's still human triggerable, but deep enough that the resulting avalanche um, would be very dangerous. That being said, you know, it sounds like the person asking the question has, has already kind of touched on or, or considered one of the really uh, important factors to consider when thinking about deeply buried weak layers is the concept of thick to thin. This was something that we were very concerned about last year when the problem in the interior was that deep persistent slab throughout the majority of the year is we ended up with this concerning weak layer buried you know, at the base of the snowpack, you know, well over a meter and a half, in some cases two meters, that kind of thing. But it still remained rider triggerable, whether it was, you know, you're a sled or ski or whatever, for the majority of the year, because of that sort of thick to thin, there was, you know, certainly areas in the Alpine where you had uh, upper tree line, lower Alpine, where you'd have significant um, variations in snowpack depth. Um, that's not unique to last year. I mean, there's always places where you have that significant variation in snowpack depth. And so, you'd find areas where that weaker layer was closer to the service, you know, 60, 80 centimeters down. It's in well within the uh, prime depth for um, human triggering. And then it had the ability to then propagate into much deeper uh, snowpack areas. And so that's certainly something that, you know, you should keep in mind going forward with this particular problem, because as I mentioned in some areas, we're already seeing it buried down, you know, a meter and a half, uh, that type of thing. But, you know, with the concept of thick to thin, you may find areas where there's been more wind effect, it's been kind of scoured down a bit, and it's only, say, 60 centimeters deep, 80 centimeters, whatever. And it's, you know, within that depth of human triggering. Um, so, yeah, 80 centimeters, that's kind of the short answer. I think keep that number in mind. If it's down 80 centimeters, probably still human triggerable, but also deep enough to produce um, a very large and, and destructive avalanche. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time to go through and answer all the questions. It was really helpful. Yeah, actually, just before we go on, I'll yeah. just backtrack slightly. You mentioned uh, the South Rockies uh, social media account. Yeah. They also actually have a really good video of some remotely triggered avalanches as well. And, and also within that video, they're doing some snowpack tests and stuff like that. So yeah, South Rockies got a lot of really good uh, content at the moment. And actually, earlier in the presentation here, I showed some photos of remotely triggered avalanches. A lot of that was from our North uh, Northwest field team, sorry. So they've got a lot of really good, relevant content on their social media at the moment as well. Yeah, and I think actually that holds for everywhere that we have a field team. If you ride or ski in an area where we have a nearby field team, it's definitely worth heading over and giving them a follow. Uh, really good local information and, and quite specific to what you're going to see in your area. So I would recommend giving them all a follow. Yeah, definitely. Your screen. Cool. Okay, well, uh, I'm really glad that we had a chance to ask all those questions because I think there's a lot going on there in terms of what's happening in the backcountry and it's definitely not our regular March setup yet. Um, obviously, still quite a lot of the spring to go. We're not done yet. so. If you are thinking of heading out, it's going to be super important that you keep an eye on those forecasts and you make sure that you know what's happening before you head out. Um, oh, let me just share my screen again. Sorry. Just realized I hadn't done it. There we go. Um, these webinars obviously are a good starting point for avalanche safety. We talk a lot about some really helpful things to know and some really specific things to the situation we've got now, but it's only just the first step in your lifelong avalanche education journey. It doesn't stop here. Uh, the best way to keep learning and to keep your skills honed is to take an Avalanche Canada training course. If you haven't taken any courses yet, AST1 is going to be the place for you to start. If you've already got that AST1 and you're spending more time in the backcountry, then an AST2 is probably for you. There are also loads of options for training that are not a full AST course. Companion Skills Rescue is a great course to take, and you can take that over and over again with different providers to keep your skills fresh. Uh, if you need some convincing that that's a great course to take, uh, check out the Cherry Bowl story, which you can find at avalanche.ca. Uh, literally a story about a group of people who are here today because someone else took a Companion Rescue Skills course. Uh, another really helpful course that you could take after AST is the Managing Avalanche Terrain course, and that gives you travel skills, a tune-up, and you can take them as many times as you like. All the Avalanche Canada training courses are run by folks who are vetted by AVCAN and follow our world-leading curriculum. So you can be sure that your instructor is a licensed AST provider and that they are going to be following our world-leading curriculum. We're proud to have such a great variety and diversity in those providers, so you're sure to find one that's good for you. In addition to that training, we have loads of resources on our website that can help you learn more about avalanche safety and how to plan your trips into the backcountry. A really good place to start is our online tutorial, Avi Savvy, and that is totally free to use. Uh, okay, let's give some things away. Amy, could you pull us some names for prize winners, please? For sure, yeah, thanks, Sarah, and great job, Tyson. Always really appreciate hearing from you and learning from your expertise. So tonight we have three prizes from the North Face and the two um, toques, we'll start with the one she's holding up there, thanks Sarah, go to Kirsten Schultheis and the next toque goes to Philippe Hemmeline. And our final prize is a North Face Powder Hood. Thanks for showing that one as well. And that goes to Valeria Aguirre. And I'll just put our email address into the chat box. So make sure you send us um, an email if you won one of those prizes. And thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Amy. And well done to you if you won a prize. Make sure you send that email to producer at avalanche.ca. We appreciate your interest in avalanche safety. If you can afford it and you would like to help by making a donation to Avcan, you can use the link that's going to appear in the chat box to donate, or you can scan the QR code on your screen. You can donate for to essential programs here at Avcan for as little as $10. This wraps up our webinar presentations for this season. We've really enjoyed sharing them with you. And remember that all the webinars from this year and our past years can all be found on our website. There'll be a link in the chat for that. Thank you for coming out and showing an interest in avalanche safety. We've made this season, one, this season of webinars one to remember, and everyone who's attended one has been a big part of that. 
We hope you enjoy your spring adventures in the backcountry, safe from avalanches. Good night.